Hey, it's great to see all of you. What a day the Lord has given us to gather together and worship. Some of you walking in, we're talking about, uh, I'd like to be worshiping outside. Perhaps we'll do that again, but it's a beautiful day to gather together and worship the Lord and sing his praises. And um, we're grateful that you're here with us. We're continuing our series on the book of Colossians. And uh, I'm excited to introduce to you our guest preacher in just a moment. Uh, you've heard me talk many times uh, about my pastor's cohort. It's been a great gift to me. Uh, pastors from around the country, we meet a couple of times a year on location. And when this began, we would meet in particular parts of the country uh, to get information and learn from top level leaders and theologians in the world. And that was really beneficial. But over time, what became more beneficial to me was not the people we were learning from but the other pastors we we're learning with. And I began to really love these men and appreciate them and see them as brothers in Christ and grateful for them. One of them, who's here today, is named Danny Strange. Uh, and he's actually a, has a PhD, so it's fun to call him Dr. Strange, even though I'm sure he's t tired of hearing that. But I would, we would sit and talk about ministry, about life, and, and many, many times he, he would say things that were so wise and insightful, I thought, I would love for him to come and share some of those thoughts with our church family. So today is that day. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Danny Strange. Good morning, Chapel Street. How are you guys? Good, good. Well, like Pastor Jeff said, my name is Danny Strange, and there were some rumors I had to clear up last night at uh, Mill Creek at our Saturday night service, and so yes, I am a doctor, but not that one. Uh, second, somebody said, are you the famous theologian from England, Danny Strange? And I said, oh, no, I'm not. I am Danny Strange. I'm not that one. And someone said, I heard you have six kids. I said, yes. That's the one. I'm that one. I'm that Danny Strange, regular Danny Strange uh, with six kids. And it's a joy to be with you guys. We actually, uh, Pastor Jeff talked about the cohort gatherings. One of them that we got to have in the last couple of years, we were here at Chapel Street. Uh, we heard so many great things about what God was doing in your midst that all of us as a group said, hey, can we just devote one of our gatherings to see what God's doing at Chapel Street Church? And so uh, we, we came out here. We got to tour all the different campuses. We got to see what the Lord is doing in Shepherd's Heart Ministry and such a beautiful thing to see the work of God in a local church like this. And so it's uh, such a privilege to be here opening the scriptures with you all today. I, I wanna share a couple of kind of background about my own family. I said I have six kids. Here's a picture of, of my family. My wife, Jessica, and I have been married for 20 years. Actually, this summer we celebrate our 20-year anniversary and we had four sons biologically before feeling compelled to adopt uh, twin girls from our county through foster care, and so Jackson, who's the tallest in this photo, now he's shadowed by Carter. Jackson is 16 now, Carter's 14. Hudson up there in the top left is 12, Brady's 10, and our twins are eight, and I am exhausted. And so it is, <laughs> man, last night, staying in a hotel, I felt like I was at the Ritz-Carlton, uh, Ritz-Carlton Geneva last night, so... Um, <laughs> And it's wonderful to be with you today. We're in the book of Colossians. We're continuing in our series. Uh, we've been talking over these last several weeks as a Chapel Street family about uh, being filled with the fullness of Christ. And as we turn our attention to chapter three, what I would love to address are the times in our lives where we don't feel filled with the fullness of Christ. Uh, rather, we feel depleted of him. And so we're gonna read the text together. You can turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter three. Colossians chapter three. We'll read together verses one through 11. And Paul says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on, on, that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these two, you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Don't lie to one another. Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices 
and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. This is God's word. We're gonna talk today about moments in our life when we felt drained of Christ. And so I figured it would be fitting to start with a story from my own life. Uh, This was February of 2020. Uh, There was a pandemic that happened in March of that year. This was before that, pre-pandemic, February 2020. Uh, I found myself in a season where just spiritually, I just felt like I was at a, a low point and I couldn't figure out how to get out of it. I had been in ministry for 20 years at that point. I was 14, year, 14 months in to being the senior pastor at our church. And so the transition was a good transition, but there was weight with that. I felt the weight of senior leadership over an organization and a church and God's bride. I felt I just, a lot of decisions had to be made and I was making those decisions and some of them people didn't like and that was new for me. People used to like everything I did until I was the senior pastor. I don't know if you've experienced that. We went through a season of change in our ministry that caused people to get angry. We went through a season, someone in our church made some terrible mistakes, and we went through a season of church discipline that affected him, and his sin splashed on his family and his community, and that was difficult. We walked through a season with one of our staff members whose daughter was tragically killed crossing the street on the way to school one morning, and that was heavy on my heart. We had a staff member that I let go from his employment, who was one of my closest friends. And so my wife said, I felt like you just fired all of your kids' friends today. And that was hard. And, and so I was in a place where there was just a lot of stress, uh, a lot of anxiety, a lot of weight. Uh, and I was having trouble sleeping. And so I thought, well, let's do the things that I normally do to recharge my spiritual batteries. And so I tried to pray more. I tried to read the scriptures more. I did a solitude retreat. I got out of town for a few days, right? I did all the things I normally do to get recharged, but it felt like my, my battery was draining faster than I could fill it up. And so February of 2020, I found myself in one of these cohort meetings that Jeff was talking about, sitting with five or six pastors who, in my mind, were all the all-stars of the faith, and here's me. And I'm trying to decide, am I going to be honest with them about the state of my soul or not? It comes to the time in the cohort gathering where we're sharing how we're doing, and everyone's doing great, up and to the right. Batteries are filled. God is moving. My church is growing, right? Everything's wonderful. My wife loves me, right? All these things. I'm thinking about getting some more kids, they're saying, right? All these great things. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, do I want to pretend and play the pastor game? Not that they're pretending. They're being honest. (laughs) But I didn't really have energy to pretend anymore. And so uh, the spotlight came to me. Danny, how you doing? And, And this image popped into my mind. I said, guys, you know, you know when your phone battery gets low and the battery sign on your iPhone turns yellow, right? And it says entering low power mode. I said, yeah, we know what that's like. I said, I said, I think I entered into low power mode like four months ago. And the problem is I can't figure out how to get out. I said, all the things I do to recharge my battery, right, are not getting it green Again, I'm stuck in the yellow and I'm starting to get a little frantic because I'm wondering, did I break my battery and I need to figure out how to get a new one or something? I don't know where you are today. Or maybe you are filled with the fullness of Christ. He is in you and he is everything and you are celebrating and you're thinking, this guy is a downer, right? Because you're green, you're charged, you're plugged into the source. But I would ask, even if that's you, I'd ask all of us today to to even look at this image on the screen and ask yourself, where am I today, right? Am I in low power mode? Am I dangerously empty? Is my battery, is my tank empty? Am I depleted of Christ altogether? Because this passage that we just read, it talks about the fullness of Christ and setting our hearts on things above and just being all in with Jesus. And yet... As we read between the lines of this passage and as we consider the work of God in our own lives, I think we'll see pretty quickly that there's an alternative reality that many of us find ourselves living in, which is that we are longing to be filled with Jesus, but we're having a hard time figuring out how to get there. And so if that's you today, 
You've come to the right place, right? This is the place to recharge your batteries. But this is also the place to encounter what the scriptures say about how you can be filled with his fullness and move from a place of depletion to a place of being filled once again. And so let's jump into the text. And I'd love to put the first couple of verses on the screen and, and show you some of the things that we see. You know, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11 starts out with these two pairs of commands. And the first pair of commands are right here. We see the word seek. Uh, that's something that God calls us to do. We see this command to set our minds. That's something we can do. And with both of these commands, we have the same thing we're supposed to seek and set our minds of, the things that are above. Right? So when we first approach this text, the, the first thing that comes into our mind is, okay, this is what I should be doing. But on the flip side, we also can read between the lines and see some of the problem of the human condition, which is that the condition of the human heart is to set its mind on all the wrong things. That's kind of the default position of where we are. The reason we need to seek our things above, set our mind on things above, is because we tend to focus on the things that are on earth. This word things seems like a strange word, like Paul could have thought of a more precise word to describe what he was talking about. But as I studied the, these phrases about seeking things in the New Testament, I realized this is actually a phrase that's used often in the teachings of Jesus. I think of a a scenario in Mark chapter 8, where Jesus and Peter get into a bit of an argument. It's a big one, right? Jesus uh, is telling the apostles about his death and resurrection, and Peter says, surely not, Lord. This will never happen to you. And Jesus says, do you remember what Jesus says? Get behind me, what? Satan, Satan right? And we stop there because that's enough. But then he says this, he says, you are not setting your mind, the same construction, you're not setting your mind on the things of God, the things above, but on the things of man, the things below. We get this idea that sometimes our, our hearts aren't being filled with Christ because our minds are set on earthly things, right? The worries of this world, the pains of this world, the distractions of life, the passions of our heart, all the stuff that's of the world and not of God, like 1 John tells us later. And Jesus talks about this same phrase in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 6, as he's talking about the things of this world we naturally get consumed with, our food, our clothes, right? I was very, I wanted to make sure today that I dressed exactly the same as Pastor Jeff, and I think I accomplished that, right? <laughs> food, our clothes, we're consumed with earthly things, right? And Jesus says, don't worry about those things, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. And then he says this, he says, for the Gentiles seek after all these things, the same phrase, they seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Now, if you're taking notes today, you can write this down. Our spiritual battery gets drained when we set our mind on earthly things. Now, chances are you're not taking notes right now because your mind is set on earthly things, right? That's not, I'm not trying to guilt you to taking notes. I'm just trying to contextualize a little bit, right? You might be sitting there and you're trying to focus on what God has, but there's things of this world that your mind is just tuned to be set on instead. And so Colossians 3, even these first two verses, teach us that the opposite is true as well, is that our spiritual battery gets charged when we set our minds on things above. Right? So this command to lift our gaze heavenward, lift our gaze upward, comes in the first two verses of this passage, right? which begs the question, what, what are the things above? Right? We can kind of quantify what earthly things are, but what are heavenly things? And the first thing that we see is a heavenly thing is Jesus himself, right? Our, our battery gets charged when we set our minds on Jesus himself. In a sense, he is the thing above. Uh, Paul says, set your mind on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He is primarily the thing above. Does anyone know what Colossians 1, 15 through 20 says? I'm not going to I'm not going to quiz you, but it says that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for all things were created by him and for him, right? He is everything. He is the one we set our minds on when we start to learn how to seek heavenly things. But we know that Christ is not a thing. We also know that Paul doesn't say heavenly thing. He says heavenly things. And so if we want to expand where to set our minds beyond Christ in an appropriate way, 
where else can we expand it? I think we can safely say that our, our spiritual battery also gets charged by setting our mind on Jesus' plans. And this is what we said, what, this is what we see in that same passage in Matthew chapter six, where Jesus says, don't worry about what you're gonna eat, what you're gonna drink, what you're gonna wear, for the Gentiles run after all these things. The Lord knows what you, knows that you need them, but, what does he say? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you as well. His kingdom, his righteousness, these heavenly things. This is the same concept we see in the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus, or sorry, this is the same concept we see in the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus teaches us to tune our minds on heavenly things. He says, start by praising, extolling the name of God, who is in heaven above, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Bring this kingdom, this plan down here. And then Jesus right sets our view of earthly things. Give me today my daily bread. I don't, need, I don't need to lead a Fortune 500 company. I just need to eat dinner tonight, right? Give me today my daily bread, right? Forgive me of my sins. Lead me not into temptation. Make me a forgiver of other people. Keep short accounts in me. Let me start to live out your kingdom values in this place. Let me seek your kingdom, your righteousness, and let me trust all the other things that are on my mind will be added to me as well because that's your purview. My job is to set my mind on heavenly things. I set my mind on Jesus. We set our mind on Jesus' plans for us. And finally, setting our mind on heavenly things uh, means setting our minds on the Spirit's desires. And the, another place we see this construction in the New Testament is in Romans chapter eight, setting our mind on the Spirit's desires. He says, those who live according to the flesh set their minds, same phrase, on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. I just wanna pause in our Colossians study for a moment and ask you two questions. Question number one, what are the things of earth that you tend to struggle with setting your mind on too much? And how do you set your mind off of that thing this week? What is it? My right, second question. What would it look like for you to devote some energy to setting your mind on the things above this week? Right, coming to church is a great practice to charge your battery. It's like you're plugging in your iPhone for 60 minutes on a Sunday morning, and that's awesome, right? I feel like this is a supercharger station, like a Tesla. I don't know if you have Teslas in Chicago. We have Teslas in San Francisco. It's like a supercharging station. You get like almost a full battery just in an hour. Awesome! But right, we all know that no iPhone nor any Christian can survive with a single charge a week if you're using it. Right? So what are the things you can do this week that can charge your spiritual battery? How can you set your mind on Jesus this week? What's a practice you can engage in? How can you set your mind on his kingdom this week? What's a practice you can engage in? How can you be aware of the Spirit's desires in your life this week? What's a practice you can engage in? How do you take your eyes off of the things of this world Focus your mind, fix your eyes upon Jesus instead, and learn that even as you do this, the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And how do we start to get in this rhythm of the charging and depleting cycle of the human existence, right? Because that's what we see in the first couple verses of Colossians 3, is that there's a rhythm of life. Let's stop focusing on the earthly things. Let's start plugging into Jesus and we can get to a place where our batteries can be filled again. But as we keep reading, we see that in this text, Paul starts to bring us into some behavior where our, our batteries can start to be depleted faster than we can fill them, right? He talks about some things that can uh, drain our batteries uh, pretty quickly. He says in verse five, put to death, Therefore, what is earthly in you? Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry, this list of vices. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming, he reminds us. In these two, you once walked, he reminds us, when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Right, some of us just need to get into the daily cycle of charging and not depleting our spiritual batteries 
But some of us look at a list like this and we need to be honest with ourselves that some of us are experiencing our batteries being depleted because we're engaging in behaviors that are destroying our soul. I remember I had an iPad one time that, that just, it wouldn't keep a charge. And I try to plug it in and use it, but while I'm using it, I see the little like lightning bolt, green battery, but the number just keeps getting lower and lower and lower, right? And some of us can be in seasons like that where our batteries are being delete, depleted. And Paul says, this could be because you're engaged with behaviors that are like a virus in your system. It's eating your battery and you're draining faster than you can keep it charged. Now, what do you do when that happens? I sat with a guy this last week. This is one of those stories I can't tell at my church, so I'm glad I'm here because I got to tell somebody. I was at, last week, I was sitting with the guy. Don't tell him, right? And I've been walking through premarital counseling with this couple for the last five months, preparing for a marriage that was supposed to happen in two weeks from this weekend. And in the last premarital counseling session we had a couple weeks ago, I just started feeling like there's something going on here that they're not telling me. And so I pulled the guy into my office and I say, hey, there's some red flags I want to talk about. I said, I feel like there's more going on behind the scenes. I said, I checked in with the people that you said were your closest friends to see how you're doing. And they said, oh, he's doing okay, but he told me he talked to you about the big thing. I'm like, what's the big thing, right? What is this thing that you're telling your friends you're talking to me about and you're not talking about? And he's like, oh, it's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing. It's all a misunderstanding. I'm like, what's a misunderstanding? He's like, it all is. Like, can you please just tell me what's going on? And he wouldn't tell me. He's like, oh, no, it's, it's nothing. Everyone's blowing it out of proportion. So I'm like, all right. I'm not a mind reader, but there's something going on here. And over the next 24 hours, by God's grace, I think, uh, I know, but it just was hard. It, it started to come out that the thing he wasn't telling me was the thing he wasn't telling anyone which is that he had been engaging in inappropriate conversations with women over the last several years who were not his fiance, who were women he met online, women from our church, women in his friend group, close friends of his fiance, having all of these conversations and solicitations to all of these different women, and no one had been saying anything, but they all thought he was a creep because he was a creep. I don't know if that's a theological word, but that's what I felt. And so I'm like, hey, let's meet again. And so I pull him back in, and I'm like, hey, man, the gig is up. Right? We got the screenshots, right? We got the evidence. We got the receipts, right? We, I know what you're doing. Like, I cannot do your marriage. I cannot recommend you marry each other. I cannot recommend she marries you. You need to get some help. You need to go through this, go through that, go through this. Right? I just like laid it all out there. You've been engaging in this behavior that's been destroying your soul. And as I shared it with him, I wasn't being mean. I wasn't being angry. I wasn't pointing fingers like I am right now. I wasn't doing any of that. I was just laying it out there. And, and while I laid it out there, I see this guy. He just like, he just went into like full shutdown mode, like, like a robot movie. And his battery went out, just like, doom, doom, doom. He didn't do, he didn't make the sound effects or anything, but he, but he literally was sitting on the couch in my office, just like not moving, staring at the ground like he experienced a full body shutdown. And the image that popped into my mind as we're thinking about spiritual batteries was, was this image, right? Of when your phone dies and it's like, it's dead, dead, right? It's like, I'd like tap on him a little bit and the sign would come off and then like, boom, it'd go back to black screen again. Like he was just dead. And I realized like, right, he had sin that was destroying his life but he was also spiritually exhausted from trying to cover up and tell different stories and keep his account short and make sure this girl wasn't telling that girl. He was exhausted from keeping up this appearance for so long and trying to look like a good Christian guy that when it finally came out, he wasn't relieved, I don't think. Man, but it's finally like he let down his guard for the first time and the state of his soul just kind of appeared before me, just dead, just dead. What do you do? when you're at a place that your battery is drained because of stuff that you're doing. And I think back to my own story. And as I was thinking about this text and my own spiritual drainedness in 2020, and so I wasn't engaged in any big sin, right? Why is this happening with me, right? I mean, some of the stuff on the list I was doing, I was getting angry, right? I was starting to think, come on, people, what's wrong with you, right? I was, some of these things were starting to creep up in my life, but I, I wasn't having my battery drained because I was a, a, engaged in some illicit activity. And I'm thinking through it, okay, I was... 
I mean, there were other people who were going through some, some sinful behavior that was draining me. They were stressed, consumed with the things of this world that was draining me, right? For me, it was a compounding effect of all the earthly things that were waiting on me, the sins of other people that were waiting on, waiting on me, the, the stuff that was starting to come out of my own life with bitterness and anger towards people that was waiting on me. All of this stuff compounding together was like I was using all the apps on my phone at once and my battery was just draining. And so if that's you, Right, right now, because of sin or just because of exhaustion or whatever it is, or if you get there someday, what can we learn from this text uh, about what to do next? Right. My attention is drawn in this text uh, to a verse we haven't talked about yet. This is in verse four or verse three. Uh, before Paul tells us to put to death what is earthly in us, he says something else. We can put this on the screen. He says, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You have died. It's funny. He's not just saying this to sinners, like you're already dead, your battery's dead. He's saying this to all believers. He's saying, hey, hey remember, when you're engaging in behavior that's draining you, what you need to understand is that if you feel like you're dying, you're already dead. That's, that's the first starting point of realizing how to recharge your battery is realize you are already dead, right? You have died, therefore put to death what is sinful in you. But I notice he says the same thing in verse one. Before he says to set your mind on things above, he says, for since you have been raised with Christ, set your mind on things above. Right? You're already dead, so put it to death. You're already alive with Christ, so set your mind where you already are. He grounds us in the reality of the gospel truth about ourselves and then says, now do this with your behavior. Right? What I wonder is if you're in a place where your battery is being drained or you're having a hard time charging it, if there's a chance that you're trying to do all the right things or trying to stop doing all the wrong things, but you've drifted from the eternal reality that's true about yourself, that if you feel like you're gonna die, you've forgotten, you're already dead. If you're trying to, so hard to set your mind on things above, you've forgotten, you're already there. For Paul, understanding how to be filled with Christ was always grounded in the gospel reality that what happened to Jesus had already happened to him as well. All right, Galatians 2.20. Paul says, this is how I live my life. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the body, I, I live by faith in the one who loved me and was delivered for me. I, I'm already dead, right? That's my secret to living. I'm already dead. Right? Learning how to... Take your mind off of things below and not let your battery get drained is a good thing to learn. Learning how to set your mind on things above and, and charge your spiritual battery is a good thing to learn. Right? But you could write this down as well. The secret, the secret to keeping your spiritual battery alive is staying constantly connected with the truth of the gospel. Constantly connected to the truth of the gospel. Ground yourself in the reality that you're already dead like Christ died for you. You were buried in the grave in baptism. You are already alive, like his resurrection. You were raised with Christ unto new life. And so maybe if you're in a place of deadness today, uh, your job is to go back to the gospel and start over again. Right? Maybe because you've never done it. Right? Maybe because you've been trying real hard to live a Christian life, but you've never gone to Jesus himself and said, I need a new life. I need to be dead to my sin. I need a new life that only you can give. I need your spirit to make me new. I, I need something new because this isn't working. Or maybe, because after you started with the gospel, like Paul says in Galatians 1, now you're trying to achieve your goal by human effort. And to Paul, he's exerting effort. He's setting his mind on things above. He's not setting his mind on earthly things, right? He's putting to death what is sinful in you, but it's all grounded. It's all tethered to the reality of the gospel. All right, so as we decide how to live these things in the next few minutes, I'm gonna give you a couple things that you can do to start to live out this reality of spiritual fullness by connecting with Christ and his gospel. And you can write these things down if you're a note taker. If you wanna experience transformation in these things, number one, believe the realities of the gospel message are true of you today. 
Now, I say today because sometimes when we think about the gospel, we think about it as a future thing. Right? Someday I'm going to die. We all die. Right? I don't mean to be spoiler alert or anything, but someday we're all going to die. And then I'll be raised with Christ. Right? The gospel is that what happened to him will eventually happen to me too, and that's true. But I notice in this passage and many others, when Paul talks about the reality of the gospel, he's not talking about something that will happen to you. He's talking about something that has already happened to you. You've died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. You have been raised with Christ. These are past tense realities. The moment you believed, you put to death what was sinful in you. The moment you believed, you received a new life. And so learning how to walk in the reality that is already true is as much the gospel as anticipating a future where someday, he says in this passage, you will be with him in glory. Believe the gospel realities are true of you today. Second, tune your mind to seek Christ and the things of God. Tune your mind to seek Christ and the things of God. There's a verse in the New Testament that says to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ, right? What? You start to get consumed with the things of this world. Oh, don't worry about those things, right? You start to get engaged with sin. No, put to death what is sinful in you. Tune your mind to Christ and the realities of, of God. Now, I love that, that the church is memorizing Colossians 1, 15 through 20. And if you're new, is that a challenge for you? That's a challenge for you. If you're new, you don't have to do it, right? But it's a great thing to do because memorizing scripture is a great way throughout your week to tune your heart and your mind with what is ultimately true about Jesus, that he is before all things. In him, all things hold together. If you're wondering if you could hold it together, memorizing Colossians 1.15 and remembering that in him, all things hold together will be a a beautiful uh, salve for your soul in the midst of the anxiety about things of this world. It's a way to to marinate in the scriptures, tune your mind to the things of God. All right, third, If you want to live out these truths, treat the sin in your life not as habits to be broken, but as enemies to be killed. Enemies to be killed. I think sometimes we we don't remember how much that our sinful behavior wages war against our souls. Oh man, yeah, I got some bad habits I picked up during COVID nineteen, right? Uh, and it's like I picked up a parasite in Mexico. Oh right? ah, yeah, I picked up drinking too much. Right? Ah, I picked up whatever it is, being mean and snappy to all my coworkers. Oh yeah, I picked up being disobedient to my parents. Right? It was just a hard season. We all went through it. Right? Oh, yeah, someday I'll address it. Right? And then we wonder, man, why am I so spiritually drained all the time? Why am I so bitter all the time? Why am I so anxious all the time? Why am I so stressed all the time? Right? And, I think we need to consider the sin in our life, not as just a habit that needs to be broken, but, but almost like a cancer in our bloodstream that needs to be eradicated. And Paul goes, gives us this vision in Colossians 3, almost like you're dead, you're raised, right? And so this is not theologically correct, but I, I picture in the old cartoons where like the animal dies and their soul like floats up to heaven, right? And now our soul is playing a harp, not true in the Bible, but now our soul is in the, in the heavens playing a, I don't even know how to play a harp, playing a harp. And we're looking down at this body that's dead on earth, right? Bugs Bunny, whatever it is. And, and we see that our body down on earth, it's supposed to be dead, right? The, the dead part of us is still trying to come back to life like it's some zombie movie or something, right? It's engaging in behaviors that are killing us, right? And, and it feels like, right, that's too dualistic. That's not true. But, but there's a bit of a tension we see in the scriptures where we are dead to the way we used to live, but now we need to put to death our bodies that are living the way we used to live, right? He said, you used to walk in these things, right? The wrath of God is becoming, coming because of these things. You used to be one of those people. The wrath of God was coming on because of things like this. But you're still, your body's still doing these things that look like your old life when you're supposed to be living a new life. Right? So the teachings of Paul consistently are put it to death. Consider yourself dead. Become alive by the Spirit. Put to death these things. Right? Maybe there's something you need to confess, something you need to put to an end to in your life, right? Treat the sin in your life as enemies to be killed. And finally, recognize that in the church, we are in this journey together. I started even to get to that when I was talking about sin a moment ago. Right? Confess your sin one to another and you will experience healing, James says. Right? It doesn't merely say confess your sin to God. He says confess it to somebody else. And I think that part of what we've forgotten is the way that God has designed us is to experience righteousness and freedom in the context 
of community. And sometimes living in transparent community is the only way to have our spiritual batteries recharged. I would probably say all the time. I think back to my experience, February 2020, sitting in this cohort meeting. And all I want to do is hide my despair from my friends because I don't want them to judge me. I want them to think that I got it all together, but I know that's a lie, right? That's where the sin starts. And, and so I decided, like I said, I decided to be transparent. And then I kind of like braced myself, right, for the lectures or the like, oh, let's distance ourselves from this loser, right? Or let's start a new cohort. Let's replace Jeff with Danny. Get him out of here, right? But instead, right, as you would guess, people were gracious, People were prayerful. And what you might not expect, and what I didn't expect, is is that as folks went around the circle, most of them said, hey, I feel for you because I've been there myself, and this is what God led me to that ultimately got me out of it. And they each shared something that I had never heard of that ultimately, as I applied their wisdom into my life, I started to see my battery start to grow up and up and up again, right? God is gracious, and God probably could have recharged my battery however he wanted, but God saw fit, like we see in the scriptures in my life, to recharge my battery through the wisdom of others in community. I think this is one of the reasons that as Paul kind of recapitulates his argument at the end of this passage, he lands on the beauty of being one in community. I'm going to close us here by reading verses 9 through 11, right? He talks about how to live life in the community of faith. He says, don't lie to one another then reminds us of the gospel, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices and you have, in the past tense, put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. You're being filled with Christ. He's doing his work in you. And then he reminds us about the church community. He says, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. It's a beautiful and gentle reminder that in this room, in this church, around the world, throughout time, we are the body of Christ. And so in the same way that you might need to go to a friend and borrow their iPhone charger to get some juice for your battery, he says, it's true of you as a human. We need one another to survive. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. So let Christ dwell in y'all, not just in you. Maybe you need to hear that today. Wherever you're at, I would love to close us in prayer and pray for you that God would fill you in this place and help you walk towards habits in your life and away from certain habits in your life to bring you into his image and fill you with the fullness of Jesus. Let's pray together and then we'll respond in song. Jesus, I lift all of us up to you, all of us in this room, watching online, across these different campuses, throughout this region, around the world. And first of all, we we submit ourselves to the truth that you are the image of the invisible God. You are above all things. In you, all things hold together. That you are the head of your body, the church. That you will reign forever. That you have filled this universe with all of your fullness and we are only filled in you. And yet, Lord, we come to the table today with uh, open hands, and we say, Jesus, we we don't feel filled with you. And some of us have engaged in in activities, sin in our lives that has depleted us, and we come to you asking for forgiveness. Some of us are, are fearful of bringing up the transparency of our lives in community, and we pray that you'd give us courage to find healing in a, in a small group of trusted men and women in our, or women in our church. But some of us come to you and we are grateful because we are filled with you and we pray that you would hold us fast to you because we know that we are prone to wander. And some of us realize we just need to shore up our charging cycle because like our iPhones, we find ourselves getting to the end of the day and needing a charge. We pray that you would charge us and fill us today and that you would help us to create rhythms in our life this week where we take our mind, like mindfulness, off of the things of this earth, where we set our mind on things above, where you are. We pray that you would make us a people who fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And let us be filled with all the fullness of Christ as we fix our eyes on you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes.
That is... Uh, I just want to say thank you. Danny, I heard you last night and again today. Thank you for challenging us practically and for pointing us to the gospel. That, that song, yes, let's just say thank you to Dr. Strange. The phrase in that song reminded me, uh, that's when my life began. That's what we're talking about in Colossians. It reminds me of what we just heard Danny preach on. That your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. Brothers and sisters, go now in the grace of the one who has redeemed you, forgiven you, and set you free. Set your mind on him. Amen. And go in peace.